Fremont is the spiritual director of the, see if I get this right, the Center for Spiritually Integrated Arts, and uh, has formerly uh, served in um, a pulpit in Baltimore, and he's served on many committees within our organization, including the Spiritually Motivated Social Engagement Committee, Diversity and Equity, and currently um, on the Sacred Activ a new committee uh, on Sacred Activism, uh, which I'm very excited that we are uh, doing. Uh, he comes with a, a wonderful background based in education, in martial arts, American Sign Language, uh, all, <laughs> a love for uh, all things superheroes, so in honor of him, I'm wearing my superhero socks today, yeah, make sure you guys see him over there as well, yeah, oh, careful, there we go, okay, yes, I <laughs> got, my, got my Rev Raymond socks on, and now I can't get my pants down, so. maybe that's what they're doing sometimes in church, they're just trying to, trying to get something adjusted in the... Anyway, I better get off this stage. <laughs> Simply take an inhale and feel that divine and holy ruach as we prepare to anchor into these amazing words of affirmation to align and anchor our consciousness. So if you are ready, I will say it first, then you say it with me. Ready? I am awake. I am, awake. I am available. I am, I am enough. I am, enough. I am ready. I am awake. I am available. I am enough. I am ready. I am, I am awake. I want more. I am awake. I am awake. I am available. I am enough. I am ready. And so it is. So, SLCA, thank you once again. Reverend Dr. David Alexander, thank you once again for inviting me and allowing me to be here with my family. I love and appreciate all of you. Now, are you ready for this today? You just said you were ready. You just said you were ready. So, we're talking about this idea of playing with paradox. And I want to leave you with just to, because we could go down the rabbit hole with Alice and see the Mad Hatter and a whole bunch of folks talking about paradox. I'm going to leave you with two really simple ideas about paradox. One, question. Question everything. Ask questions. Number two, be in the mystery. Be in the space of, huh, huh. Before anything is composed, there is space. There is an empty page upon which music is created, upon which a canvas, upon which paintings are created. There is silence before words are spoken, the mystery. So for this idea of playing with paradox, ask questions and be in the space of the mystery, the space of creativity. Okay? You good? Yes. So because, and I said this, raise your hand if you were here Friday when I spoke. Okay, so you, you all got the memo that, that one time in my life I was a public school teacher. So once again, I'm going to invoke that individual, and I need, do I want it? I'm going to just ask folks. Reverend Dr. David, do you mind standing up at the edge of, and uh, Al, do you mind standing at the edge of, and I'll do the third. So I want you to face him, you face him, and what I want you to do is simply raise your right arm and point to the right. Which one of us is correct? 
So, thank you, gentlemen. So, in referencing paradox, it's this idea that there can be multiple ways to perceive a variety of things. And what we tend to do is, there is only one way to make lasagna. <laughs> there is only... Now, okay. Believe it or not, I have relatives... I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Believe it or not, I have relatives who put sugar in their grits. <laughs> right? Right? There are very... There are, <laughs> there are... I don't talk to them, though. Just let it be known. I... <laughs> There are various ways. If I were to ask you, how many different ways can one make lasagna? How many recipes would we come up with? Vast numbers of. So this idea of paradox is, can I, one, be in a space of? There are more than one way. There is more than one way to look at whatever it is I'm looking at. There is more than one way to perceive what someone says. What it means. Because we can say something. Oh, stop. 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 Right? Same word. But it's a different feel depending on how it's said. And yet, oftentimes, what we do, what we like to do is... Remember that thing you said to me? I believe it was February 28th, 1974. You've been holding on to that since. Are you serious? Because someone will say something and immediately we feel whatever that is. And their intention, speaking of being intentional, their intention may have been a compliment, but the impact was an insult. And we don't understand what, 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 I, what I said, what I meant was but how it came across, how it landed. And see, oftentimes we don't take a couple of steps backwards to really assess what did I do, what did I say that actually landed that way? What exactly did I mean when I said? So let, let's, let's explore this, either or, because that's what we do a lot of, either or rather than both and plus. So one, did anyone in here see the film Oppenheimer? Okay, do you remember there was a scene in there, and I don't remember the young woman's name, but she basically asked him, so what, what, quantum what? And he was explaining quantum mechanics, quantum physics. And he said about light, there are times when light behaves as a particle, and there are times when it doesn't, and it behaves as a wave, and there are times when it's neither of these. So light is saying, <laughs> you think you know me. Now you don't. Because light behaves. And yet, it's science. And we often think of science as very clear cut. It's only one thing. And yet, what it's showing us is, because where is God? Everywhere. Everywhere. It's everything. So God is expressing in, through, and as light. And what it's teaching us is, we are multi-dimensional, multi-energetic, multi-faceted ways of showing up as the divine. You are not just a one singular Tupperware kind of individual where you say, I am a 57-year-old African-American black gay man who lives in the United States. You, know, you are more than that, Ray. Well, I am what I do. When I was a public school teacher, no, you are more than just that. And oftentimes what we want to do is pigeonhole ourselves. We want to be neat little automatons in this container of, because what we like to do is easy categorization. We want to label things. We like to label things, which is one reason why when someone changes the label, there's an element of, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute pronouns, what is, what is, what, what, no. No, you're changing stuff. According to the rules of English, well, the rules of English have always been, and we fight it because we like being same old, same old, same old. It's almost like we love the concept of driving forward while looking in the rearview mirror. Think about a lot of things that are 
foundational to the United States of America, the Second Amendment, the many things in the Constitution. Like there are so, that's a seven-day seminar. There are so many things, but let's, let's talk about for a moment when the founding fathers, rearview mirror, because how often are they invoked as if they are here today signing documents? So you want to buy a gun, you say? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we invoke them as if their word is law here, now, today. Where when they were saying, so we're still fighting the British and we need to arm ourselves and we're going to politely ask the Native Americans if we can borrow their land. <laughs> We're going to steal their land, and we're going to have to fend them off, and we're going to have to fight bears and lions and tigers and stuff, so we need weapons. So they created Whereas today, just that, just that, and 90 rounds go. I can guarantee you that if they were here today, writing this document today, it would be a very different consciousness. And yet the people today focus on this as if it's current events, rearview mirror. So we want a world that works for all? We can't continue to think we're going forward by, by driving rearview mirror. Old new thought. How often do we say things still today that we're not really questioning? We're not really breaking down and extrapolating and deconstructing. There's a lot of colonization within New Thought. Did you know that? If you didn't, I invite you to start there. But it's there. There's a lot of toxicity within New Thought. When someone says to, remember that 57-year-old black gay guy I just mentioned not too long ago? So last year, when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, there were many, well, I shouldn't say many, there were about 10, 10 New Thought folks, a couple of practitioners, two ministers who were in unity, but two ministers nonetheless, and several other folks who asked him, Ray, what's in your consciousness? Why did you... So I said, what now? What did you just say to me? Are you serious? They perceived that I somehow had, in my spiritual mind treatments, made the decision or something to say, knowing that there is an infinite power, an infinite presence. What? There is toxicity. When there are ministers and practitioners who refuse, not just question they refuse to use pronouns they refuse open at the top ever evolving consciousness you're still using this telephone huh how many people are you connected to two literally okay rear view mirror if we're going to for real, move into a complete new era of the beloved community, a world that works for all, then we have to start questioning, what does it mean? Now, oftentimes, you know, we come to, we come to church, we come to the center, we, come, we take classes, and we, we have this idea. We know what God is, we know what spirit is, we know what the universe is. We, we know, we know, we know, we know, Ray, we know. But doesn't it still benefit us to ask the question? Just because you know something, going back to Oppenheimer, in mathematics, the, the four women of, did you see the movie Hidden Figures? Okay, these four African-American women, brilliant mathematicians, you have to revisit the foundation of mathematics in order to elevate mathematics. We have to know the foundation of new thought, religious science, science of mind and spirit, in order to elevate it to the point of this is what is required of us to move into a world that works for all. But see, we're still wrestling with the idea that, 
Uh, I must think. Uh, hey, watch it. So, I'm so broken and miserable. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. I'm so broken and so miserable. We still refer to ourselves. Now, we, we generally don't do it outwardly, but in those little conversations with one another, just over coffee, we say things where the affirmation that we are saying is actually a judgment and a criticism of ourselves. We criticize how we look. We criticize how we, I'm so clumsy, I'm just the klutz. Oh, I put on an extra five pounds. I'm so ugly now, or I'm this, or I'm that. I I don't like my hair. Well, I don't have it today, but I don't like my hair today. And it means something, something that quantifies and qualifies how good we are. And yet the paradox says you are already whole, perfect, and complete, even while grieving, even while going through a medical diagnosis even while going through whatever this painful thing is, both and. Now, how do we walk that both and? So a gentleman by the name of, you probably heard of him, Pierre, he said, we are not human beings having a uh, spiritual experience. Uh, We are, now I lost my train of thought. We are, because I was thinking where I was going to go, I'm going to just go to where I'm going. We are spiritual beings having a spiritual experience that we call human, right? Because when we start referring to ourselves, well, I'm just, I'm just a human being, or whatever that is, we're referring to ourselves as being finite, and yet God is infinite. And Dr. Holmes said, and uh, several folks say, that whatever is true about God is true about us. So if God is infinite, and God is not abundant, but God is infinite abundance itself, and whatever's true about it is true about me, then do I speak about myself in those terms? Do I limit myself when that which I am, because there's only God, right? And if there's only God, then everything that each one of us is, is it. Just like how many humanities are there? When we talk about humanity, how many are there? There's only one. When we say what we are trying to get is for humanity to understand. what There's only one humanity. There's only one human species, at least on this planet. One human species. And yet there are various incarnations of this concept. When do we start speaking about ourselves as perfect and whole and complete, even while going through the grief and the sadness, even while feeling the anger of, you know, so my grandkids just started school the other day and they had to go through the whole uh, active shooter drills and how to take your bulletproof backpack and use it as a... Even in how do I speak about my and their and our and the only wholeness, perfection, and completeness that there is? Because if we're not having that conversation, if you went to a physician and because the job of a physician is what? To keep us healthy. Ideally, the job of a physician is you go in, you get checked up, they notice some things that are, ah, your knee is like, ah, and then they do something to help bring us back into a balanced state of health and well-being. What if you went to your physician, and as soon as you go in, and you sit down for them to do the whole reflex thing, and the doctor, you sit down, the doctor comes over and says, ooh, was that your back that just cracked? You getting old, Ray? I don't know if I'm going to be treating you for much longer. What? Open open your mouth and and say, ah, uh, (coughs) you need a mint. (coughs) How long would you continue going to that physician? They're insulting you. 
And clearly, they're not on the same page. They're not on the health and well-being team that they ideally, for you, they're not, it's not in alignment. But we do that with so many other things. We do that with family. We won't have healthy boundaries. And we don't question why. When I visit whomever I'm visiting, why do I let them push my buttons? What is going on that every time I go see my mom and dad, I immediately go from a 57-year-old man back down to, hey, mom. And I don't question it. I immediately just revert into the five-year-old who was abused and berated and... So this idea of paradox says, let's start asking questions. When we say, in our Declaration of Principles, we say, we believe that heaven is within and that we will experience it or we experience it to the degree that we are conscious of it. What does it mean? And not just what does it mean, because we can, what does it mean forever and a day? One of the things that Shannon and I were talking about this morning, it, anybody, anybody in here love to cook? Like cooking is your jam, that's your thing. Okay, so you understand the concept of cookbook. You understand the concept of recipe. You can read and memorize 4,972 recipes, but if you never mix and stir and taste and bake, fry, cook, whatever it is you do, what's the point? Why memorize all of these recipes if you're not going to make them? And some of us won't make them because, well, Penelope, I don't want to mess it up. So we won't experiment. We won't even get into the arena of, you know what? You know what, Annie? Check this out. I, I, I have never in my life made this thing. I have no idea. Matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to open a distillery. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix and blend and I'm going to, oh, that tastes like Listerine. That's not good. And I'm, like, I'm going to do stuff just to test it and see rather than, but what do most of us do? Many of us, many of us, not us, not clearly not us. What many folks do, I would rather remain in the realm of the untouched for there is no mistake in the realm of the untouched. And from the land of the untouched, I will point a finger at those who mess up, and I will mock them while I remain perfect. The realm of paradox says, get out there. Get messy. The only way you can throw a pot and actually create a vase, a cup, a mug, a something, is throw the mud, Spin the, oh, spin the mud and get messy. It's the only way you can do it. The only way you're ever going to learn to be a master of any instrument is occasionally there's going to be a, eep, oh, wow, what, what was that? There's going to be a wrong note somewhere in the learning how. And even one of the things that Reverend Dr. David Alt said Friday night, was this idea of singing, and sometimes your voice might crack if you are singing from... When I was growing up in Pittsburgh, and, you know, my mom and grandma and, you know, would not would talk about cooking every now and then, if something was so good, we would say, they put their foot in it. Yeah. Right? That's the concept. It is so good you put your foot in it. The only way to get there is by being willing to mess up. Knowing that even the mistake is part of the process. That's the only way we grow. Having courageous, challenging, conflicting conversations about subjects and topics that make the hairs on the back of our, once again, I lifted it, make the hairs on the back of our neck stand up. The only way we're going to do that is by doing it. Put a foot in it. So we have to be willing to ask ourselves, 
What does it mean for me to live as the embodiment of, I believe that heaven is within. Where is within? What does within mean? What is heaven? To the degree that I am conscious of it, what does it mean to be conscious of? Because see, if I do this and simply look forward at camera two, I can't tell that I'm black. For real, because I don't see my skin. So what does it mean to be conscious of? It means at some point I experienced my blackness to the degree that even if I don't see it, I know it didn't leave. <laughs> so being conscious of heaven as the state of my mental equivalent means that even when I don't necessarily see heaven because I'm sad, both my parents died. Right, my mom died during COVID. Both my even in the midst of surfing grief, I may not see this. I may not smell this. I may not. I can't. Uh, this is what I see. This is what I smell. This is what I hear. Grief, sadness, isolation, loneliness. But I'm still aware and still conscious that I know that's there, even though I'm not feeling it right now. Right now, where are we? Where are we? In, okay, and where, what city is this located in? And what state? Okay, so we're, we're aware of the address, the city, and the state. Does Japan still exist? But we're not there. They're not here, but we know it exists. Right now, pause for a second, just listen. You hear any music? But we know that music exists. We're conscious of it, and we know that because we're conscious of it, and because it's there, that at any moment, gentlemen, can y'all come up and sing? Can you play again? Can you play? We know that it can be evoked at any moment because of our consciousness of it. When do we start doing that with a world that works for all? When do we start doing that with decolonizing new thought? When do we do that with whatever this is? I don't refer to it as homophobia anymore or transphobia because those individuals are not afraid of us. Transmesia, there's a hatred of. Now, we could talk about what the hatred is, but it's a hatred of. Because if you're afraid of somebody, you don't actively go to them with banners and signs and be like, ah, ah, when you're afraid... because. Have you ever seen videos of people park their cars at some park and then a bear comes and like tears the car apart to get to the Cheetos inside the car? Very rarely do you see some dad or granddad like, come on, Yogi, I got you. No, because no, we saw the, rem the revenant. We saw what happened to DiCaprio. You run from the bear. You run from what you are afraid of. You don't attack it. So homomesia, transmesia, etc. If we're not willing to have the conversation about, because we say everything begins in consciousness, right? What is the consciousness that creates a racist individual? Somewhere their mental equivalent is in alignment with that. Well, how do we heal it? How do we First in consciousness, because what does a physician do? Once again, a physician, you go in, they check you out, they look through your chart, they do whatever they need to do, they're, they're assessing, they're looking, they're evaluating, they may test a few things, they're looking at a couple of things, and then they come back to you with a plan. We are so avoid conflict, avoidant, people-pleasing, codependent, several other things that we don't want to have those conversations. We don't want to engage people here about how do we change the consciousness of that? How do we hold? How do we vision? How do we pray? How do we act when we're out in the world? A friend of mine years ago who worked at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. 
took a sign language class with me one time and we were talking about something afterwards. And the Dalai Lama was in the process like two or three days of coming to you know, his annual DC trip. And Jeffrey said, oh my goodness, Ray, it is, it is amazing. Because they never tell us when, because for security reasons, they never tell us exactly when he's going to be there. They don't have to. You feel it the moment he steps on the property. Something changes. He said, you could be a staff member of this congressperson and a staff member, and you're, ah, ah, and something will shift, and you're like, you know what, you know what? Let's, just, let's just stop for a second. What, 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 what just happened? Because Elvis is in the building. When do we start to align our consciousness so profoundly? Because we know. Have you ever walked into a room? It could be silent, but you know that there was an argument or some conflict before you came in. You feel it. Have you ever sat on a bus, a train, sat in a restaurant, and your back is somewhere, and you feel someone staring at you? So we understand that there is something going on. That's why quantum mechanics will say we are, you know, things are 99.999999% empty space. And then they'll say, well, you know, technically, you know, Lee, technically, it's not really empty space because there's still energy in the space. The room, if we cleared everything out, the room might be empty of chairs, but are there not still molecules and things moving around? Yes. There has to be something there because if nothing else, spirit is there. So when we start to say, well, time out then, time out. Let me ask myself, well, then what does it mean for me to show up with the realization and the understanding when Dr. Holmes said, there is a power for good in the universe greater than I am, greater than you are, and you can use it. And I always tweak and say, well, yeah, I mean, come on now. There is a power for good that is the universe itself. It is all that is. So clearly it is because it is the infinite versus the finite. It is vastly. And because it is what I am, I can't help but to use it. Every breath is it breathing itself as me. Every word is it speaking itself through itself as me. Because there's only God. When do we start to try that garment on and start walking the walk of my words create. Breathe that in. Your words create. How could they not? In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that word became flesh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we understand that the law receives and acts accordingly. As Baji said, the immutable law, it receives and acts accordingly. When do we start to really embody and understand, as once again, one of our Declaration of Principles says, we believe in the direct revelation of truth through our intuitive and spiritual nature and that anyone may be a revealer of truth who lives in close contact with the indwelling, all-dwelling God. That means when you speak, divine truth. When you speak, divine truth. It is always present as all that is. And if what we're saying is, yeah, I, I, I can't balance my checkbook to save my life. I just, mm, uh, mm, criticism and judgment is the land in which I live. If that's what we're doing, if that's the song that we're singing, then that's what we're in alignment with, that's our mental equivalent, then what are we going to create other than? And the thing is, you know, because oftentimes, for, and I understand, linguistic convenience. I, I completely understand linguistic convenience. There are times when we will talk about being in alignment, but we won't specify in alignment with what? Because my understanding is we can't be out of alignment. If I, am, if I am racist, then I am in alignment with racism. If I am homophobic, then I am in alignment with... 
if I am in alignment with or in alignment with, what am I in alignment with? Let's start clarifying. When people refer to, and, and once again, I know, linguistic convenience, because I do it sometimes too, linguistic convenience. Positive, negative. We vilify the negative, and yet the negative is yin. The negative is feminine energy. That is not bad. That is not the enemy. The darkness is not the enemy. The womb is dark. That is not the enemy. So let's start clarifying and saying, instead of positive and negative, is it life-affirming or life-denying? Does it elevate or does it suppress or oppress? When we are more clear on what it is we are saying, how it is we are showing up, then we have far more power, intentionality, far more power to actually start to change things. Imagine if Baji came up here and I said, Baji, do me a favor, could you do a treatment for me? And Baji says, of course. And I say, so what I want, I already know. Oh, cool, because I, I got you. And then Baji says, ah, breathing into the infinite, I am praying about something regarding something regarding something about Ray. <laughs> and knowing that something is manifesting right now, because something must manifest right now. And knowing that something is happening right here and right now, and something will continue to happen, I surrender the somethingness into the something of law. And <laughs> what? Wait, wait, Baji, hold on, right? There's no way, because Baji knows and understands there has to be a level of specificity, because what she speaks is the truth about what she's speaking about. So there's clarity. How many of us had a family member, a mom, a dad, a somebody, grandma, mima, somebody that you went and said, uh, what, what's, what's for dinner? Food. <laughs> I want to know specifically what is for dinner. Food. We do the same kind of vagueness within new thought which is why we will not address the dis-ease and the illness of racism, sexism, homomysia, etc. And it is time to get very specific and call it for what it is and address it. Now, the paradox says, but I don't know how. You don't have to know how. Bob Proctor would always say, we use electricity. I don't know how it works, but we use it. I don't have to know how the law does what it does. Do I trust and believe that it does what it does? I don't know everything about when the treasurer is receiving tithes. What, what exactly are you, what, what, where's the, I don't, I, I don't need to know. I trust and am convicted in that trust because I know that my consciousness is in alignment with the beloved community, the work that we are doing, the what it means to serve, the what it means to be of service, to the degree that there is no separation between who I am and what I do. Because I can guarantee you, we heard three gentlemen sing, we heard a saxophone, we heard piano, we heard. And I can guarantee you that because these are masters at the art of music, that there are times when they're just sitting somewhere, sipping tea, sipping coffee, doing something, and all of a sudden, whew, they hear a breeze, and there's a whole melody in the wind. And there's a mental note, remember that. And then they go back to, hmm, hmm, and there's something, and let me write it down, and they're, let me start to play it, let me start to play, let me start, hmm, and then they concretize it and make it solid and then build upon it. Music is always around us. Love is always around us. Evolution is always around us because God is. And if we're not willing to step into the space of, I don't have to have the answer to be in part of the solution. We are a species that loves answers. So we ask why a lot. We ask why even when why isn't the most effective question. I don't have to ask why did both of my parents drink. I don't have to ask why. More empowering is what was the effect it had on me 
then? What about now? That healing, that addressing, that, I don't need the why. But we ask why to a lot of things because we've been, we've been indoctrinated to believe that the moment we ask the why, we become Sherlock Holmes. And somewhere in there, the, we, we, begin, we begin to pontificate about, well, what this dear Watson, what are you with as my pipe man? And we get down the rabbit hole of why, 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 why. We get to the end. We still don't know why. So we do it all again. It's what I refer to as metaphysical tiddlywinks. <laughs> We're not going to get anywhere doing that. At some, stop laughing at me. At some point, we have to get real about. As Dr. David says, you know, we've been around, New Thought has been around for a long time. And we've had a New Thought that amount. It's time for a new thought. Are we willing to challenge ourselves? For example, sit down with someone and have a conversation and say, uh, Alan, anybody familiar? There's, there used to be a television show. I don't know if it's still on because the host made his transition inside the actor's studio. Okay, so you know Lipton at the end of, he would always ask these questions. So do like this, this Barbara Walters kind of thing and have conversation and ask each other. What is your, when you, when someone says, what is God, how do you express what God is? When someone says, what, when, in, in this new thought thing, you talk about consciousness, how would you explain that to a five-year-old? Right, Because the other thing we tend to do is we use words that cost $4,000. <laughs> right? Which is one reason why people still think we're Scientologists. Because we're, we're not speaking the language of the people. So let's start having conversation. What does a world that works for all mean to you? What does a world that works for all mean to you? When we say all, who is all? Is all y'all or is all, all, like, what does that mean? And, and how do we, in your mind, in your processing of it, how do we get there? What would be one first step to actually take to doing this? Because if we're not going to have those conversations, nothing's going to change. I keep using the example of physicians because we're metaphysicians. Physicians get together at conferences and conventions, and they will put up charts and talk about heart disease and brain disease and all, like they talk about this and they talk about, they show photos of all kinds. They show photos of the insides of the body of things I really don't want to see, but they're talking about it. Why? Not for the purpose of, I would like to address your attention to patient 774. <laughs> that's not what they're doing they're looking at all of disease and illness and symptoms for the purpose of healing how do we heal any patients that have this when this shows up how do we effectively help them heal we don't do that we do not, we get together, we get together at a variety of functions and things and whatnot, and we blow smoke, excuse me, that's not going to change anything. So we have to start getting real, and we can't get real at, at conventions and conferences and retreats and events and things and things if we're not doing it in one-on-one -on -one interactions. When something shows up, sit down and ask, what is principle applied to this look like? What is principle applied to this feel like? When I know, because once again, we are not bound by rearview mirror precedent, we are bound by principle. So if I am bound by principle and this shows up, principle says, 
Oh, which then informs me to act a certain way. Penelope, and I don't know, do you play the violin? You probably do. You said no, but I, yeah, I think you do. Because I know, I know. But we'll, I'll, I'll take your shake head for a second. Penelope plays based on principle. Penelope can improv because of principle. Principle gives you, because the foundation is there. If the foundation wasn't there, then it would be Ray. <clears throat> G-A-G-E, G-A-G-E, C-C-B, yay. <laughs> That's not principle, because I, I don't have a foundation. What is your foundation? Signs of mind and spirit, what is your foundation and what does it call you to do in the world? What does it call you to be in the world? Like one of the things I said Friday night regarding as an African-American or black man, I have a choice per se on how I am active within the community. I can be active, engaged, and committed to Black Lives Matter. I can go to rallies, I can go to meetings, or I can choose not to. But it doesn't change the color of my skin. It doesn't change how I am perceived in the world, but how I choose to engage. Same thing for being LGBTQ. How do I choose to engage? We're being invited, we're being called to ask, how do I want to show up? in the world today? How do I, how am I called to show up? That's our invitation. That's our call as ministers. And so it is. Thank you.